Natural Selections, which focuses on garden design and education. And she's going to present a program on how we can create a pot and then change the pot throughout the seasons and as the seasons change. So please join me in welcoming Michelle. Thanks for having me. Um, my favorite garden tools are a $3 hand leaf break I got at Christmas tree shop 15 years ago. Um, I leave my leaves. I don't clear out anything in the in the um, in the fall. And um, I love my Felcos, but I prefer a four and a ten. And I'm left-handed, and I use the standard one. So that's my summary. I love your um, the the mix of everything you're doing, and I love your sense of humor, which I think we all need right now. So I'm here today to talk to you about containers. Um, I am a native plant person. I sort of fell into it kind of poor was cool. Um, about 17, 18 years ago, um, I did the Master Gardener program at Massport. Um, my grandpa taught me how to garden. He was a composter. He grew roses, tulips, and tomatoes. Um, I liked the worms. Uh, and the penny candy that we got after. Um, but what he really taught me was um, that I love to get my hands in the dirt. I like to be dirty. Um, I learned, I did a, like a vegetable farm as a teenager, and my mom was always amazed I was the dirtiest one. <laughs> what did you do? Well, there were these cool things. I crawled around and found stuff. But I'm also a nurse, and I used to think that my two like different sides of my work were kind of disparate and unrelated until a couple years before the pandemic when it started to come together for me and it's really all about health. Um, so much of what I talk about with native plants and organic gardening and composting and not using any weed killer and all of those things come from protecting human health and also the health of the greater environment. So. To me, using perennials and containers kind of goes with that. Um, because we, we can get into ideas about spending less money, about driving around a little bit less, about supporting pollinators and micro environments right up close to your house, and all sorts of other things. But it's interesting to think about, this is like kind of the perfect setting, it's really handy by the way, um, and the gardens are amazing, is the idea of Yankee thrift. So, you probably have seen samplers, or stitch, you know, cross stitch, um, with the saying, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. Have you seen that before? <laughs> That's loosely attributed to Calvin Coolidge, who you may not know, you may know it was our 30th president, but you also might not know he was our 40th governor here in Massachusetts. Uh, so he was born on the 4th of July in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. Has anybody been there? Super fun. Totally worth a visit if you're up that way in Vermont, um, his homestead. And then um, he died actually in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, but that phrase is sort of the basis for how we think about the concepts of Yankee thrift. And the idea of recycling, about using something over again, about repurposing things, um, is certainly not new, right? It used to be literally about there was no option, right? You couldn't use it for Home Depot or Mahoney's or Lowe's or another garden center to get what we needed. You'd have to make it or figure out a way to use it or find some other way to repurpose something. What's interesting to me is I have three teenagers and my eldest, who is a sophomore in college, is an avid thrifter. So she, she doesn't buy new clothes anymore. She thrifts everything she wears. And she just has some awesome outfits, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and it's through her sort of thinking that I sort of restarted evaluating the idea of Yankee thrift. And the tenets of that are, are as follows. Don't buy things you don't need. If you've got something, you've got to buy something, make it as inexpensive as possible, or figure out how to amortize the cost over a couple of years. Heavily research your major acquisitions. Know exactly what you're buying. Harder to do these days with lots and lots of reviews online. Right? Which ones are real, which ones aren't. Um, buy mechanical things that are serviceable. Also harder, since most things, appliances in particular we buy, right, are computer driven. And then buy fewer non-mechanical items of good quality, which won't wear out as fast. 
perfect connection to the favorite tools <laughs> and the literal manual labor, right, of gardening. Um, so with all of this and the idea of concepts of treading lightly and recycling and reusing things, I sort of put together seven reasons to use perennials. Um, and I'm going to re review them with you and talk about some examples. And I have handouts for you all at the end with yeah. these plants. So you don't have to try to write them down. Um, obviously, it's just a start. Tip of the iceberg. Um, I have to hold myself back when I do these lectures, right? Because once you start shopping for creating containers, it's kind of hard to stop. Um, I have three for you all for your opportunity drawings. And I'll talk about these three here. And I'll talk about why the plants are in them. And, why, how I pick them, and then some other examples. Um, and I and to, and sort of kind of hold myself back and even have some cuttings so it's not bringing me the whole plant, just pieces of plants, because sometimes some things aren't familiar to folks. So, a question so far? Everybody hear me okay in the back? Yes. Awesome. So, one reason to, tr to, to do um, a perennial in a container or some combination of perennials, herbs, vegetables, something with, that's useful um, to you more than just for its beauty purposes, the lovely flower or color perhaps that an annual may bring you, um, is to try something new. So in that idea, new variety, new color, new texture combination, or maybe something uh, in a new season, extended season. So um, lots of ideas there. Um, you've probably seen more recently um, variegated iris. They don't bloom particularly well, but their, le their leaves are awesome. They're the typical sword-like iris, but they have um, sort of a two-tone, more, um, more like the color of this pasta, where you have a green and then a more yellow green. Um, autumn aster is another, uh, autumn, autumn fern, and um, swamp milkweed. You've probably seen that more lately as well. So swamp milkweed I love because it blooms orange. It blooms this sort of pumpkin color orange. And then it grows these super fun seed pods. Um, and they, they don't open quite the same way as the traditional milkweed, the favor of the monarch. But um, you'll see this more often now. Um, it does not require particularly boggy or wet conditions. It is a favorite of bunnies. So growing in a container is helpful. So that because that off the ground. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, and then the autumn fern is in this one. So this is a shade combination container. And this is the autumn fern here. And it, it, it's a little bit different than like the, the more traditional native ferns in that it has this copper color, which is kind of a nice um, supplementation this time of year. So that's sort of round one, the, the sort of try something new idea. Um, Drawing pollinators is another other thing to do, and I love the idea of bringing pollinators up to the windows. So all through COVID, I had clients calling me up, hummingbirds came, right? So great. I had decided when I was, I don't know, four or five years ago, I, I sort of relegate things to um, different times of my life, and usually it's about time. Like I said, I have three kids, I have this job, which is sort of a side business, I'm a nurse full time, I have a husband, he likes to see me sometimes. <laughs> and um, I decided that I was going to try to figure out how to get hummingbirds later. Because I had read about trying to wash out the feeders, and if you don't do it often enough, you're going to like poison the hummingbirds, because you're going to have bacteria, and there's sugar water, and that's kind of worse than not having them come at all. Um, and then I read further when I was reading about pollinators, and that cardinal flower is a favorite. Um, and if you just have the red as a calling card, They'll, they'll come to about anything that has um, a longer shape that they can get their, their um, beaks into. Um, so this is what I plant every year in my containers, and I use it for clients often as well. Um, and this is all that it requires is like the, come on over here, <laughs> and they come. And they visit my, like my now my autumn late blooming pasta, um, they love the honeysuckle, the native honeysuckle, which in my house, of course, we call honey shuckle because that's my last name. Um, and um, we even threatened to name our first daughter that. Honey. Um, my father in was not, didn't find that funny. Um, but all ideas to sort of bring the pollinators um, to you 
wherever you want to put your container. Certainly a doorstep is, is a possibility, but where you have a, a possible like a south facing window that you can look out, that's a really nice, nice thing to do. Um, butterflies are another one, um, and certainly uh, to, to draw, um, gomferina is one you see a lot this time of year, which doesn't come out very early in the season. You know this? Looks a little bit like a thistle. Um, like it's kind of fun because it dries actually like a thistle, like sort of brown, which goes well with you know, containers that will transition as the color you know, changes throughout the season. Does it help you pass these around or is that just distracting? So Gomphrina, the purple here, is um, one that you wouldn't necessarily expect would be a butterfly favorite. Um, but I put them in containers with a client and I actually got a photo from, from her three days later. And there was like a cloud of little white butterflies around the flowers. And it was just like a constant moving through the, through the drought. It's been dry here too, right? Um, it's different. The weather's different. It's not raining in Boston right now. Um, so you never know. But um, just a you know a moving, it turned into like a moving container, which is, was really stunning. Um, native helianthus is another one. Um, I don't know if you all know that most sunflowers now are bred to not pollinate. So sunflowers are messy, and when you bring a sunflower home and you cut them and you have them on your table, native sunflowers that are helpful to the pollinators will leave pollen and a mess on your table. So more often than not, you have to seek out sunflowers now that are beneficial to pollinators. Um, the native helianthus are. Um, this is one variety. <coughs> These are the, um, some of the ones they grow like six feet in big sort of groupings of stalks. They tend to tip in weather like this. Um, I leave them all year and they'll, the, the birds will come um, and perch on them through the entire winter and eat the seed. <coughs> Um, so I put them in containers in the beginning when they're a little shorter and then transfer them to the garden and they find their new home and they're a little bigger so they're less likely to be a bunny magnet and then um, will will be a good food source. Um, Minarda or bee balm is another one and the benefit of that for your, for your pollinators is you're going to have it up um, likely a little bit more away from other plants. You're going to most likely be watering it right into the container so you're going to help prevent the um, very common powdery mildew on that bee balm. So you'll likely get the sort of interesting flower. Um, it sort of over time. Did anybody grow bee balm? Over time, awesome. Over time, right, the flowers change quite a bit, and they have sort of interesting life cycles, and they're kind of fun to watch. Interesting to consider using those in a pot, um, a container up by your house, so you can see that transition, and then at the end of the season, you put that in your in your garden. So those are the first so two ideas, the sort of try something new and the pollinator idea. Um, another idea is um, using um, your containers to ease your access. Whether that's because it's a mobility thing and it's much easier to have something a little taller for you, closer to your house, perhaps not quite so far across the yard or garden from your door. I certainly find that I use herbs much more if I have them right by my door. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I tend to do is start them in my vegetable garden and then move them to my containers or the client's containers throughout the season. They make lovely fillers, um, interesting textures. Um, well, this isn't one you necessarily use for eating. This is the Phenomenal Latin, a newer variety. Does well in our, um, the amount of moisture we have here over the winter. So I wanted to put one of these in the container and I'm already smelling it. It's amazing, right? So to have something like this by your door to brush up against is Comes like a little gift, right? Coming and going. Um, in this container, in this shade container, there's rainbow chard as a filler. So it's right there in the middle, the red stems. Kind of an unusual um, idea for a container. And obviously, you're not going to get a whole dinner from this. Uh, although, I'm not a particularly large green span anyway for the cooked greens. 
Um, but some people are, and that's awesome. Of course, you can grow more in your vegetable garden. Or if you find that you have a container and you've got something like chard um, or kale in your garden, you could certainly um, transplant a start into a container and use it as filler, and then not be seeking some other sort of green that's going to complement something other um, that you already have in your design. We have a um, up in, in um, Waltham, Massachusetts, is Brandeis University. Brandeis has a, um, a forestry program, and there's a lecturer there who, um, named Brian Donahue, he, um, he talks about trees and plants and ecology like church. I love to hear him speak because he is reverent about like the depths of the systems and how our choices affect people before and after us and sort of how we're all intertwined. And he talks about plants as needing to be useful, which I like as a native plant person, right? Uh, for my own garden club, I was doing a, um, a container arrangement or a cut flower arrangement and I was trying to use materials only from my yard. It was around, this, it was early in the garden club season, time of year. And I, I had at the time, I don't know, eight or ten um, Black-eyed Susan plants. I could find one flower that had no holes through any petals. Right? So not the perfect plant for the competition arrangement, but clearly the perfect plant for the garden because it was food, which is the point. <coughs> Useful. So interesting idea for you to consider. Uh, more herbs up here. There's, there's a variegated sage here. Um, this is something that you could use in a container and then bring in, use it all the way to Thanksgiving. Certainly, um, super fun because of the purple stem. So there's lots of really interesting color combinations, right? That could come out of this one, um, and of course, it's useful and scented as well. Oh, I've got basil up here too. Another one that I like to use in containers. It's persnickety. I find it does better in containers than in gardens. And in my house, we like pesto, so um, that's a good one to use. Um, particularly this time of year, um, and if you've got more than you need, you can just let it go to flower. It's not going to hurt anything, of course. Um, and then another, which I thought would be particularly useful to talk about. Has anybody seen the citronella plants? Yeah. yeah. That are more likely than nurseries? These are great for <coughs> buying your doors. If you have a container, um, you brush up against them, they will keep the mosquitoes away. We could you could probably also get a piece on the way back to your car. <laughs> Health and mosquito population here. Um, and uh, did you know mosquitoes are pollinators? Yeah, it's a little harder to hate them when you think about uh, how useful they are. <laughs> really interesting. They also ride raindrops. Did you know that? That's how they don't get squished with the rain. They actually ride the drop. They get on, go to the ground, get off, and fly. <laughs> so neat, right? Yes. Who knew? I love their containers. Yeah. Containers are great. Those little containers you're putting those in. Oh, thanks. It's a set of nesting bases. Yeah. It's very cute. Yeah. Actually, what I tell you what I thought is I didn't actually have a lot of orange going on up here because it's a little early. So I was trying to draw in all the seasonal colors. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? Yeah, works well. Works well. Okay. So um, the, that last one was easy access. Oh, I can't forget about vegetables. So there's a lot of really great new varieties of patio patio vegetables. Obviously, tomatoes can be grown in containers. This is nothing new. Um, you can do the companion plantings, right? Put the basil in there and the marigold. And yeah, the, I forget what it is. We're giving away. But anyway, keeping the bad guys away. Um, eggplant is another new one. Um, and actually, I saw this one this year, this spring, in a Better Homes and Gardens magazine. My aunt, who is 86, gives me her Better Homes and Gardens every month. And it is my, like, People magazine equivalent, like it's the like it's just it's so nothing nothing bad happens. Better part. Plants, there's paint color, there's there's like something for dinner. I mean, it's very there's suggestions on how to be healthier. It's, it's just a nice like end of day flow through for me. Um, I have a very intense book club, which I read, you know, heavy things. So it's nice to kind of quiet your mind before sleeping. Um, in there was this lovely container. And the center 
hike was a patio eggplant. So my um, youngest, who is 13, and I dutifully went off to Home Depot, found patio eggplant, and created the container. And I'm sorry that I couldn't show you slides today because it turned out stunning. And we had eggplant all summer. Just enough for like a side dish here and there, um, which was perfect. Uh, we're overflowing with eggplant, just enough. Yeah. What size container did you use for the eggplant? That one was about a little bigger than this. Okay, so like five gallon? Yeah. Yeah, bigger. Bigger than that? Think? No, this will be fine. It's, um, the depth that you know it comes in is like the nursery pot, which is about like this. Right. So and that's fine. Don't need too much more. As long as it can go out. Um, okay, so that was the the useful side of things. Um, the other another idea um, would be to consider growing things you otherwise might not try. And for me, as a garden designer, um, that's a really nice way to try out new plants because uh, new color combinations and things. Because I can sort of see how it's performing before I use it for clients. For example, knockout roses a couple years ago were like the thing; they were everywhere, and I wanted to see how they did before I designed them for clients who were asking for an easy rose right? or a a rose with no maintenance. They didn't quite perform. Um, so I have a couple examples of those things. Succulents is one of them. Um, and I, I actually um, brought this computer to show you because um, I've had this for a couple of years on my kitchen windowsill. Um, and I move it out to the patio table and move it back in. Um, because I tend to overwater and it likes it when I forget it. Um, it has a little air plant tucked in here too. Um, and succulents are expensive. They're kind of they're just maybe maybe on the on the sort of over we're over the hill on their popularity. But just like in fashion, right? There are trends in plants, and succulents were kind of everywhere. I would say 2018, 2019. Um, so I'm not going to pass this around. It's kind of heavy, but definitely come up and look at it. It's my little faux driftwood log up here. Um, and I actually thought this might appeal to you all too, with their proximity to some beachy colors and. Um, in the summer, I tuck some seashells in here. Little, little candles at your outdoor patio. Set the mood. <laughs> Music. Um, so succulents are one that's, that's new. Um, another one is uh, native arts. Did you heard about native arts? There was an interesting, frankly, inconclusive article um, in, I think it was Fine Gardening, or maybe it was Organic Gardening, a couple months ago. Um, and the idea is just a, it's a combination, right? The idea of a, of a native plant and a new cultivar sort of taking away some other feature that was bad. Uh, like for some of the native bee balm, it was trying to <coughs> geneticize out the, 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 the powdery mildew. Um, so those are, those are things to look for and to try. When you're making your selections, have you noticed when you're at the nursery the increase in color-coded pots? <laughs> So when things don't tend to have flowers on them in particular early in the season, so um, like early in the spring and then you know, June for the, the next round of plants and then late August for the so fall plants, you'll see, every, you'll see things out in color-coded containers. It's just marketing, but it works, right? So, yeah? I just want to say something about the color-coded, uh, the color of pots. Um, I read an interesting article, and actually there's a gal that we know who's interested in coming to the Garden Club who says Marie. she's into recycling plastics. Black pots are not picked up by the recycling um, uh, machines. So so a lot of that stuff that we think we're being so good about recycling, it's not the black pots, recycled. is not getting recycled. It's going into the land. So maybe it's for marketing, but also it's been a good thing because those eyes, those machines will pick up colored pots. So let's buy colored pots, kids. Look at that, and you can. There's an excuse, right? And environmentally good. Like, just had to buy this plant. Plastic pots altogether, we'd be a lot better off. Well, yes, yeah. and certainly the idea of either taking something, borrowing something from your yard or perennial, putting it in a pot and then putting it back, or getting it and then putting it in your garden after the end of your season in the container is another reason. So it's all kind of hooked up together, which is great. And I have nothing against the yellow mum. 
Um, this is like there's absolutely nothing wrong with your like the sort of more traditional right decorative cabbage, mum, cornstalk combinations we're going to see now and want maybe want to create. Um, but certainly, you know, making creating combinations that include these things, um, some of these perennials might be might be helpful. Um, another reason to um, use peren uh, perennials in pots would be to try out and then hem in a troublemaker. So um, some grasses or, or more ornamentals like lily rope is one. I won't plant that anywhere that's not like in a walkway because it's just once it's going, it's going. Um, another one that sort of tends to be a little bit aggressive that might surprise you is yarrow. Um, and it is, a, a, there are native varieties. This is the Home Depot one. This is great for um, containers because there's not a lot other than these guys right here that tends to have this sort of dusty color. Um, and so it's kind of a nice thing for containers and an interesting either augmentation or replacement for the standard um, mom because these guys are just about to, to bloom. Um, which they'll keep reblooming if you if you tend them a little bit um, and do some, some trimming throughout the year. Um, but they do tend to make little little sprouts. Anybody have had um, yarrow sort of it's all in my grass. Yeah. It's more like my to, Cape Cod lawn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is fine. Yeah. But um, something to so something to consider, especially if you want to sort of keep things a little neater. Now let's see if there's any other oh well of course there's mint. Yeah. <laughs> mint goes. Um, and I do, you know, put the mint in the pot and sink the pot in the ground and that's all fine. Um, you can put that in your in your vegetable or herb garden, but it does work nicely in containers. Um, it fills the the need of the traditional um, filler, 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 right? The little chant we all make when we go make our containers, because it does spill over the edge and it actually does fill. Um, it gets pretty aggressive and can kind of choke out other things in your pots, but then you can just make a mint tulip and it's okay. It can be useful. Um, yeah, so those are the ideas there. Um, other questions? I'm assuming that these are created in the spring. No, these pots? Mm. They don't have to be. No, you make them now and leave them outside? So it depends on the contents, yeah. Um, and I, I, can, I can deviate and talk about that a little bit now. Um, so like of these three, all of, all of these contents that are I would go home with you all today, um, I would plant by November into your garden. Um, the, the, this is a full size grass, and so is this one. So it, it, it's small now, and it will be, you know, the standard um, standard sort of decorative grass height. Um, the, the hosta, the fern, the hookera. Um, are all going to be ones that you could plant, and so the co the idea of this like this color combination, all these plants have similar needs for their light and water requirements, and obviously you'd spread them out a little bit more once out of a container, but certainly could then augment plants you already have or create a little vignette around a mailbox or a lamppost or a corner of your porch or somewhere where you are looking for something else a little more interesting. Um, so the design combinations um, will certainly work um, in the garden. Ones that you could leave over time would be um, sort of what I call as the winter container, and I can skip to that and um, talk about that now for a sec. Um, in that you could put evergreens in a, in a container and leave them there for multiple seasons. So petite evergreen trees. I actually literally dug this guy out from a planter and brought it in here. That's why it's a little floppy. It's a happy companion. Um, but I, they're not quite out yet in most places. Um, like Home Depot is starting to stock the red pot with the red bow, right? the, ones, the, the, the racks and racks they have. Um, up by me um, in Metro West Boston, there's a wholesaler called Cavicchio. Um, the trucks come down here. I see them down here, too. Um, they're well -tra those are well-traveled plants. They're a great, they do some growing there, and then um, they also do, uh, mostly the annuals, and then they do um, a huge wholesale business, and that's where I get most of my material. Um, everything there is like what you find at like a, a standard nursery, except it's a little bit bigger. Um, so that's that's really why I do that as, a, as an installer, as a designer and installer. But um, the, they, they have, 
whole sort of host of, of container plants um, for winter use there. And they'll start to make their way to the nurseries um, probably just after Halloween. <laughs> so something to consider this year when you're making your winter plans would be instead of using the cut branches and pushing them in the container that you've taken your other annuals out of, um, you could use a plant like one of these and then supplement it either with, uh, with cut branches if you want or with decorative elements. So what I tend to do for a winter container, winter garden, is um, do a combination of evergreens like this. Um, I love light on containers. Um, you know, hardcore extension cord and, a, and a, an outdoor timer. You get an extra room, which was definitely welcome during COVID, right? We were in lockdown and we needed one more place to go um, to be a little bit space from each other. And then certainly you can um, augment with decorative or dry items. So you could make a combination of plants like this and you could um, in a container supplement with seasonal items. Right, so change the look. Obviously, we're not going to plant in the nursery pot, but the idea is the same, right? It's kind of a lovely container. Right, so to bring in the fall color, and then when we change seasons, take back out your little pumpkins, gourds, and then bring out something like this. So you can use, um, of course, your own sticks. Find them in your yard and give them a quick um, spray with spray paint. I'm a big fan of spray paint, although I did not know that I could use it in a container with a brush. Um, but that's a really great way to supplement um, and um, sort of breathe new life into containers that you've upcycled, thrifted, um, found in the back of your garage and found a little chipped or a little worn looking or two different colors. Um, you can pull them together with a quick spray paint. Um, and you can do that with branches as well. These are pre-painted. This is a, like a home goods special. Um, but just even pulling those sticks then and like some sparkly lights, and you have your container, but you've actually planted it in November rather than trying to crawl around in December and stick your sticks in the thruster. So, something you consider. Um, one other... Um, one other uh, seasonal item you can find now that you can use in a container, particularly by the door. Have you all seen the cinnamon brew? Yeah. 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 So Trader Joe's it's now going to smell like cinnamon candies in here. Um, I love these. It's, a, it's, it's twigs heavily scented with cinnamon oil, um, but they are also kind of a neat combination of containers. Like I thought maybe it would look, I would cut it back and put it in this container. Mm, nice. Yeah. Kind of neat, gives you that sort of more fall look, transitions the container to autumn a little bit. So, very long answer to your question, which is deeper than my response. Um, <laughs> it smells good. Yeah, it smells good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yes, the idea is to take out whatever you put in the container before it freezes, or if it's, unless it's an evergreen, which could then last in the container, and then you can sort of move its neighbors or augmentation to have it transition with you. So, something like this, um, once the spring comes, and you can work the dirt, it's a perfect time to put pansies at the bottom. Right? Mm -hmm. And they'll fill in, or early herbs. Mm -hmm. You have early fresh herbs right by your kitchen. They fill in nicely. Then you take the pansies out when you're tired of those. If they become leggy and you forget to prune them, like that, like <laughs> I do. And then you can swap them out for something else um, that will carry you into the summer. Yeah. Do you think the evergreens can take hot sun? Yes. They can? Yes. Okay. I, I mean, as long as it's sun, a sun plant. Like, you know, not a not a shade loving evergreen. But oh, yes. right here. Okay. Yeah, like the coke away, no, but okay. these would be fine. So. Um, one thing that's interesting about um, these types of containers as well is anything you're gonna put perennials in, you're likely you're gonna be a little deeper. So you will find you won't have to water them quite as often because the roots grow deeper as well, right? When you put annuals in containers, you take them out, unless we're talking about the uh, potato vine, right? There's twines all around and they're together. Um, you'll find that often the annuals sort of come out at the, at the depth they went in with. You'll find that um, perennials put in containers will, will go to the bottom of the container so that you could water it twice a week, maybe even once a week if it's not particularly hot and it would be fine uh, because their, your container will be a little deeper and then the root systems themselves are deeper. 
Um, one more word on container types um, here. This, uh, it's, it's good to read labels if you want a ceramic style container. So this one is actually marked frost resistant, this little tag on here. Um, there is no container that is frost proof. Um, if you get a container that gets totally full of water and you have a deep freeze and it's over water and there's no drainage hole, for example, you're, it's going to crack. Um, that will happen with plastic or with ceramic. But if you have a draining container, so a hole in the bottom set on a deck or patio, obviously a riser if you're concerned about staining the surface it's on. But as long as it has a, a drainage hole in the bottom, um, you should be fine if it's a container that's, that's frost resistant. These other two up here are plastic. This one is a double wall plastic. If you come up and sort of push on it, you can feel it squishy. Um, and that helps with the insulation. The difficulty is the freeze thaw. So if it gets wet, the wa wet water right back to high. middle school science expands, that's where you're, you're going to crack. And this guy is a, um, I wanted to make everything accessible. All these materials are ones that you could find that you're like in a Mahoney's type nursery or at a big box store or like Trader Joe's um, or Home Depot or Lowe's. This is a container that I bought at um, Home Depot. I'll wipe it off before it goes to the lucky winner. But um, it was sort of a boring brown color, not too different than the fungus. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wanted to see what I could do to make it a little more interesting. I like the shape. I like that it's square. I like that it's um, um, relatively large. Um, so I did give it a quick spritz. Mm -hmm. This spray paint. It's a you know, two-minute project on your... Um, and your little moves off to the side. <laughs> okay, so that is, let's see, that we, we deviated to the winter piece. Um, and I just don't want to forget more um, things to talk about. Just two things. Um, circling back to the idea of the evergreens um, and how much all this costs. It does cost more to plant with perennials, right? Much cheaper to buy <coughs> a flat of anything really is an annual, right? Like this little guy was two dollars ninety eight cents. Was four ninety nine. But like this I will use all winter. So you can compost this one, but you know. It's something to think about. So it's sort of how you spend your money over time. Um, but it, they do cost more up, up front. Um, However, you get something, again, that you can try um, and have up close to you and, and maybe it will grow something in a different way. Um, so with those ideas, um, like this is a sweet autumn clematis. Um, it reminds me of an awesome for, for, I think, years and years, this was on the cover of the White Flower Farm catalog. Mm -hmm. um, because it's just so stunning, right? The ones that they send in the kind of lure, you just kind of to buy their bulbs from there. Yeah. <laughs> just one, one little <laughs> note about that. It is, it is extremely invasive. Yes. yes. Is it, it is? Yes, it, it is. self seeds They're all over. It self seeds all over the place. You've got to make sure that you. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got on Clematis? You just have to make sure that once it blooms, go in and almost cut it to the ground very quickly. All right. And well, the seeds are. Never mind. We're going to talk about other plants. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking favorite of it. I mean, it's wonderful. I'm a, I'm a gardener and I still have it in my yard. Yes. Just got to know how to take care of it. Okay. So the idea behind my own. Yes. Blue yes. Yes. Back out of the oven. Yes. Um, so the idea of the vine, whether it's this type of vine or you, you would need a honeysuckle, we need a label to not to get the invasive types or. Um, even a clematis in the spring, where you're going to get then the height and the really fun curly Q centers, which definitely has a better scientific name, right when the when the blooms fall off of your regular clematis, right? Okay. Super neat and fun to see up close. I have um, a client who has a garden right under a living room window, and I put a um, a Josephine clematis on a oh, um, obelisk, awesome one. and it pokes up just above the sofa. And so you can see just the sort of sculptural blooms across the top, and it really like brings the color from the outside in. It's like art out the window. It's so fun. Um, but another really nice thing about growing something like this in a pot is you do get that spiller effect without having to do a more standard um, option. This is an ajuga that does the same thing. It creeps and it makes these little, little guys on the bottom. 
seat in the back, sorry. This little guy's waving around up there. Um, so that will um, just give you a little extra um, decorative edge over the pot. But I like vines for that reason. So it's sort of a non-traditional way to have that. Um, I guess this guy can stay. As long as we're, we know what we're doing. Um, so combined certainly with um, a stilby, clematis like to have their roots not hot, right? But they're okay, so they the warmth the leaves. So a stilby is a nice companion for that. Um, and this is a carex, which I thought was super fun. Um, I love, I love variegated. I love this little white. Um, which variety is that? Combination. This one is Everest. So, um, yeah, this combination I thought was just lovely. Um, all right. So that is the the money sort of side of all of this. Um, and then we really talked with the the last thing is we sort of got into, but. Um, about the idea of, of textures and sort of what else you can bring into your containers um, and sort of how to extend the season. We talked about it a little bit here, um, but a couple other things I wanted to show you. You can actually you know, use some actual ornamentation. I thought this would be really fun in a container, especially with herbs that would grow up into it. Mm -hmm. I've used things like this before. Um, this is literally from the clearance section at uh, TJ Maxx. <laughs> um, but you can give it a spritz with spray paint if it starts to, um, to, to chip over time um, and put it back in. I, um, I use things like this, ornamentation and it pots, um, actually in gardens. So like if you would look out the window here and you wanted to bring color to this woodland edge, you could put a few containers or ornamentation out there. Um, rather than trying to establish plants, you just you know, put things in containers, use the targeted watering, not be trying to water the woods. Right? But give yourself um, a different kind of view. Um, blue is something we, we don't often see true blue in, in flowers. Right? We, there, of course, are hydrangea, which you know, I'm sure all of you are masters at growing. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot of true blue in our gardens. Um, so I love to use containers or ornamentation that, that are those colors. Um, other ideas are just other dried items. Um, a wreath pre-made um, would be quite fun with the right plant. If we had a smaller container and we wanted to just sort of make it a little more seasonal, right? Um, it's kind of an interesting idea just to consider actually planting through a wreath. Um, you may have seen that in container gardens or um, things in the winter and certainly that's something you could do as well if you wanted to have um, more evergreens in the container and you had standard wreath, you an extra wreath, you made too many, you bought too many, um, you could put that around a larger container and plant right through it, and it gives you that sort of interesting edge, covers your mechanics, flower language, flower design speak, right? Um, and then there's also some seed pods up here, and I collected these a long time ago. Um, they look like a catalpa relative to me, I have yet to figure out what kind of tree this is. You'd be the fourth garden club. So if you can put it let me know. It's the locust. In here. It's a locust. It's a honey locust. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Let's see that. So in the black locust. The um, kind of fun thing we could do here is bring forward the shape that we have in the purple grass, and also do some kind of interesting, more sculptural effects with coming over the pot. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to pull like the cooked turkey out of the oven. They're great <laughs> painted and put in um, Christmas wreaths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that's terrible. So kind of interesting. Almost like mulch in the front of the pot. Mm -hmm. um, so you may have, you know, plethoras of you know, drawers full, like I do, of the, you know, slightly silvery dusted pine cones that were in last year's Christmas wreath, and then the one before that, you maybe even had. <laughs> small ornaments, like those kind of things, you can reuse again, just as sort of decorative things in the base of your trees, or certainly, or your containers, or certainly you could actually ornament an actual shrub or tree as well. Uh, let's see, so those are the, oh, cut um, protea is another one, feathers um, would be great as well, particularly in autumn type breeds, um, dried hydrangeas, um, even the dried um, butterfly bush, like those 
the, the president was looking at that arrangement there, right? You keep those things and augment a container with that and so make it much richer um, and more interesting, particularly if you have the opportunity to pass by it, right? Close on the way or out of the door. Um, certainly consider your location of your container before selecting your plants. Again, your color combination, but also the requirements of the plants. Um, it's easy to have something, one thing do better than the other, right? If it's full sun, have a something you're trying out that maybe a shade loving plant that you're stuck in there. Um, I tried very diligently with the, this com these combinations up here um, to do that so that um, these will be successful for you all, both in the containers and then when they're redistributed somewhere else in your gardens. Um, we talked about the winter garden, and I guess I just also just remind you to think about, do you guys do much floral competition? So you're, you're going to be talking more, um, certainly about the elements of the club, plants. We have to. What's that? We're a federated club. Yeah. We have to. Yeah. So, um, no wrong answer. <laughs> let, me, let me put it this way. I'm the designer who, um, five or six years ago, uh, the judge, who was also from my club, um, who had stepped away from the club for a little bit and was there as the, as the judge, looked at my arrangement, not knowing who it was, and said, sure, sure, quite sure what she was going for here. <laughs> I, I like to break rules. I like to do things that are different. Um, but that said, like I can pull it together when I have to. Um, I had the great pleasure and honor to be at Art of Bloom this year. And what a great experience if you haven't done it. Highly recommend it. So fun. Seems so unique in Boston. Um, that's true. Um, so anyway, have fun with the with the elements and the principles, right? So we talked a lot about color, light, face, size. Um, but we didn't really talk about line and form or a little, a little about texture, right? So, like, this container, for example, is highly texturized, right? But because of the whites and the sort of dusty gray colors, it pulls it all together, which makes it, like, doable and not seem busy. Um, this one, I think, has lots of different colors and lots of different textures, but they're all sort of related, like, one to the next, mm -hmm. so that it works. Um, this one down here, this combination was particular to be able to get you all um, black-eyed Susans that weren't going to be eaten by rabbits, um, and then also the sort of autumn colors of the, um, the grasses and the mesquitoes, which are such good combinators. So everything has a purpose, but then there's also some other ways to look at it, and sometimes if you're stuck, thinking about the container like a flower arrangement can be helpful to you. Um, and my final sort of two things of words of wisdom, I guess, would be to really think about your color wheels. Um, you, if you don't have one of these, I highly recommend picking one up um, at an art store or um, you can do it online. But this one actually is a, is a Target $3 puzzle from like the dollar section when you walk in the door. Um, and I like this because you can actually pull the pieces out and try them and see what moves you. Um, or think about it ahead of time um, before shopping, and think about what you might like to do. Um, like if, if, if you're like, like for me today, thinking about like, okay, the orange is missing, right? What else goes with the orange that I like? Um, I'm a, uh, this is kind of funny, I'm a, a Michigan Wolverine. Um, my husband and I met in Michigan, mm -hmm. and now it makes total sense to me, with the opposite side of maize and blue on the color wheel, why that works, mm -hmm. which, which is marketing. Fascinating. <laughs> um, but amazing blue. Anyway, uh, and then the other thing I want to say is um, don't be afraid to think about the theory before you get into the design. Um, as a nurse, what I learned first was the theory why things work the way they work, what they work, what they work like when they're broken in the human body, um, and ways to make them feel better. And I sort of approach gardening, garden design, and working with plants the same way. I like to understand the science, the why. Um, this book from the Xerxes Society, Attracting Native Pollinators, is awesome. Um, and then specifically for container gardening, there's tons of options. Uh, your library is a great resource for this. Um, so for some visit to them in the days get cold, and you want to think ahead. Uh, but lots of options there. 
Oh, forgot. One more thing. Then, then I'll put it in. Um, the medium, what you put in your containers. Um, certainly, you can do the standard. The mirror grow is on sale about everywhere now. They don't. They don't want to overwinter it. Um, it's fine. Um, preferable would be an organic medium. Miracle Grow also makes, not, so as not to miss any market share, right? <laughs> they, they make an organic product as well. Um, costs a little more, of course. Organic premium. And then this one um, is a back to the roots version, um, a different sort of non, um, non primary brand uh, organic. But it's, it's formulated to, um, to drain well is really why um, potting soil is different. You can make your own, but um, roots do tend to stagnate um, and sort of get stuck together. So, that was a lot. I have a handout that covers everything I talked about, um, and my web address and email and phone number and Instagram are all on there, so you can reach out with questions and uh, after now. How about any questions for now? Yeah. Where are you located? I'm in Weston. Okay. Uh, you were the Weston Garden Club? Yes. And you were in the MSA uh, Art and Blue? Yeah. Is that what you yeah. I went up there. Absolutely fabulous. It was really fun. I had the um, like 15 by 12 foot Winter Queen. The whole the family, this huge like family portrait. <laughs> Oh, so yes, fun. yes, yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Give it a chunk. I don't have that around.